Hi guys, welcome to episode nine of Living Well. I am your host, Lindsay. Thank you for hanging with me. It's Tuesday, happy Tuesday. Um, it is day 92 that I have been quarantined in my house. Um, Nashville is starting to open up a little bit, so it is nice to be able to leave these four walls every so often, but um, I'm really excited about our guest for today. We are furthering the conversation about Black Lives Matter. And first up, we have American country music singer and songwriter from Arlington, Texas. She just released two brand new songs, Black Like Me, and what are you gonna tell her? She's a friend of mine, and I'm so happy to have her with us today, Mickey Guyton. Hey. How are you? You look gorgeous, by the way. I wanna thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day. The world is just in a crazy, spot right now. I mean, with the pandemic and then with this revolution, I feel like we are in the midst of, it's which crazy. I have definitely, um, my heart has just been full of so many emotions and, yeah. and I can only imagine, I know you also have been crazy busy hopping on all different kinds of interviews you release an incredible song which we'll get to in a minute but how do you feel first and foremost right now um <laughs> i know that's a big question yeah. but it's it's just been navigating the past few weeks has been has been a lot so it's been really really heavy last week was extremely heavy for me um I don't think I ate hardly a thing, to be honest. It was just, I had been feeling emotional when I saw the the shooting of Ahmaud Arbery. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when everything really started happening for me. I saw that, and then I saw Breonna Taylor, and then seeing the death of George Floyd on top of the pandemic, on top of the struggles that women are dealing with in life period and also in within the country music industry, I was just beat up. So, yeah, you know, but I, but at the same time, I feel so much hope. Like it feels like the veil has been lifted and there's so, everybody is so fired up. It's, it's so beautiful to see, like seeing you and, and Cassidy, hope becoming little, not little, but becoming activists. It's such a beautiful thing to see women in country music using their voices for like the greater good. It is so inspiring to see that. Really That's is. amazing to hear you say that. And if anything, this has lit a fire within me that I knew was there, but this is like, like, Girl, off it, my shoulders, and I'm like, bring I, it on, world. It looks so good. So bring on, world. it on. Let me tell you, when I see you using your voice, like it is hella attractive and just like, I don't know, it just like we, we all have it within us. And for some reason, we've been made to feel like our, our voices should just be used for music, but we're we have these platforms and people are looking to us the new generation wants real and when you see real it is like it is the most beautiful thing because it's like we've been living in a cloud for so long i know you know and it's like we are awakened <laughs> we are awakened you know yeah. it it was really heavy on my heart too the first time i posted about the protest i went to in nashville the first protest nashville had and our country music community is divided mm -hmm. and it is heartbreaking it to is. see, you know, I know a lot of, a lot of our friends who also started posting about black lives matter. Um, mm -hmm. People were losing followers left, right and center. Like and it, it was so <laughs> yeah. disgusting. Also, it was like, bye. I bye. do go not need you. Bye. Go back to your cubby hole. Exactly. I, I that's why I'm just like, it's like lit a fire within me. And I'm like, I will find the group of people that we can be like, yeah. yes, we all believe in this and we're heading in the right direction. But Absolutely. I want to ask you as a black woman yeah. working within an industry like country music, 
I posted a few pictures on my flipping Instagram and got felt all this hate. Oh, I saw it, girl. <laughs> and I know you did. You text me. You were one of the first people to text me. But I want to ask you as a black woman working in this industry, how hard is that? Like, do you feel that level of hate like within a show? I have not experienced. Yeah, actually I have. Unfortunately, actually I have. I'm so sorry. It's, it's okay. It, I mean, it's not okay, but I've gotten so used to dealing with it that you just, it's like, you've got this like protective gear on and you're just in survival mode, but I have seen it. And like the thing that I don't understand about it is why is it so hard to denounce racism? I know. If you say that you love God, if you say that you love Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, which the country music community is built around, mm -hmm. how on earth do you have a racist heart? Because if you have a racist heart, you don't know God and he does not know you. Absolutely. And I don't understand it. Like you didn't ask to be born white. I didn't ask to be born black. Like this is just my skin. This is who we are. How do you hate someone for who they are? And it's, it's heartbreaking, but there's, but there's also so many beautiful people that I've experienced within the Nashville community. I know the Nashville community and I know majority of the people within the Nashville community do not endorse racism, mm -hmm. period. I know that. And that's why now of all times, it is so crucial for the country music listeners to see that the community does not feel that way, that the community denounces racism. And that's why I keep saying, keep saying it, keep saying it. We're not, we're not, we're not pro riot, rioting and, and, and tearing up anything. We just want we just want to be equal. Equality. And this has, the thing that fired me up about it was this is beyond a political left, right. Thing. It's beyond this is a that. humanity thing it's about humanity. We're talking about. It's mm -hmm. about human beings living on this planet. Absolutely. Which is why I get so fired up when fans get, get upset. I'm just like, this is why about are you human beings. Yeah, why are you why are you being upset? This is about loving our neighbors. It's literally about loving our our neighbors. Yeah. It's it's heavy. It's so heavy, but what you're doing is you're a part of the change. You are on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. You are using your platform for the greater good of and you've put and it's so hard because I'm sure it puts you in a rock and a hard place because you have a career that you're trying to, mm -hmm. to keep building and, and building and selling out arenas. And then you also have this other side of you. That's like, I can't possibly promote music when I'm seeing people that I care about, um, discriminated against and, 100%. and to get even deeper women in country music, women, know what it feels like to be discriminated against. Mm -hmm. How heavy is that? I, I, Women I, in country um, music have a small inkling of what it feels like to be discriminated against. Which, so, again, it just leaves my heart so heavy for you because I know it's not even scratching the surface, but you're right. Like oppression is a difficult thing and you feel it in every aspect of your being. And I do have to say that my record label and my team are so incredible because the minute I started posting about it, they started reaching out and they could have been like, don't post these things, which would be arguably better for a business number standpoint. But they didn't say that. They were like, Lindsay, we are a hundred percent behind you. We believe in you. Stand up for what, what you, you believe in and, and use that voice for good. And so I do feel like 
genuinely we have a community around us who wants to fight for the greater good. Absolutely. But I also, over the past few weeks, have been trying to educate myself. And I feel like the problems of systemic racism in our country is also the issue that we need to untap because this is the level of racism that a lot of white people who want yeah. to love their neighbors and want and don't have a malicious bone in their body, yeah. but that has been programmed in it's the brain. In our DNA, girl. And it is even the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. But if we don't educate ourselves Absolutely. on how to take out that programming, yeah. that some that all of us don't even know is 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 within us absolutely that we're not going to get lasting change we right. all need to educate ourselves absolutely on, on how to look at our brothers and sisters as equals and absolutely. so i want to ask you i mean i have been trying to read and trying to educate and trying to learn how to become a better ally but for most people watching this that yeah. i know are our you know, fellow brothers and sisters and, and who are working to find that greater love for one another. How can we become better allies? Okay, so I'm going to give you guys an example just so you can understand systemic racism and everything that happens. So as a black woman, our hair is clearly different. And for a white person, you can go into any grocery store any superstore and there is a full on aisle of just hair products on the right on the right and on the left of just full of every hair product you can find and and i want you guys to test this when you go to the store if y'all are listening go to the store and see this i never even thought see, about that Nikki, but that's a seriously. great point. yeah so you'll see a whole aisle of hair products for everybody right and then when you look for black hair products, we get a shelf and that's it. And so that is in a nutshell what we're talking about. And all we want to be is on the shelf next to you. That is it. Put our, put our products on the shelf with you so that we can go to the same store and get our hair care products as well. Instead of finding, going online and having to go to specialty stores that we have to drive way out of our way to get to, let us go to be able to go to the grocery store and get hair products for our hair. And that's what you can do. You can also openly, outwardly denounce racism. I'm not saying you have to go and find the first black person you meet to be your friend. It has to be a natural thing. So just openly denounce racism. It is not difficult to say. I denounce racism. It is not allowed in my home. It is not allowed in this country, period. Because I feel it does start in the home. It starts it's in our own hearts home. and yes. it's in your own family. And Absolutely. that's when it will, when you only establish that first, that's when it will start to be able to filter out. Your life. Start within yourself and educate yourself. When you study history in school, in high school, you get the basic, I mean, you don't have enough time, honestly, but when you study black history, you get like a two week period of studying black history, maybe a month. And it's like, there's so much more to black history than just those few chapters. Like studying black history, I studied it in college with this UCLA professor. And I remember I left class and there were white people in this class too. And we would just sit there in that class, just gutted because there was, it was so heavy. Like you would see pictures of slaves being lynched and people behind them celebrating it and, smi and smiling and laughing at death. Hmm. And you've got to think about it. That is within the DNA of America. Like that is passed on within all of us that pain. Yeah. And so you must educate yourself and see all of the aspects of black history because we know white history. Mm -hmm. We've known it our whole lives. We've seen it in every aspect of our lives. 
and educate yourself, read a book. My song that I wrote called Black Like Me, I got that title from a book that I read in college called Black Like Me, written by a guy named John Howard Griffin, who was a white man who through radiation uh, darkened his skin to look like a black man in the 1960s during the Jim Crow era and went to the deep South to see what it was like to be a black man living in America. And it's such a prolific book that that shows you a perspective, your perspective of what, what someone, what a white person felt when they saw that. And it's heavy, but it's a really, really great book. And I think you can start right there. Just denounce racism. Amen. Give black and brown people opportunity. With opportunity comes possibility. And we've got to normalize people of color in this country so that we're not uncomfortable around each other. A lot of it is fear based because you, the fear of the unknown and why are people scared of each other? Why are we scared of each other? We're all the same. Yes. We all bleed red. Yes. We all do the same things. We just have different cultures mm -hmm. and it's just so important to, you know, try to just educate ourselves. Really. Well, Mickey, we love you so much. I so appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your day to, to come on Living Well and share your heart. Um, please check out her new songs, Black Like Me. And what are you going to tell her? They're just incredible and they're beautiful. You're so beautiful. Um, I cannot wait till I can hug you in person. I know. It's been so long. It's been so long. I, I'm trying to figure out. I, I have a record coming out in August and I'm trying to figure out if I can even get to LA. But if I can, I'm going to let you know, girl. <laughs> Please let me know. Please let me know. <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate you using your platform to give me a voice. Thank you for all that you do. Speaking up looks good on you. Everybody that's listening, your voice matters. Don't think that it doesn't. Your voice matters. It is so important. It's one of the most important things that you have. It really, really is. Mm -hmm. Mickey, I love you so much. I was so happy to have that girl on here. All right, second guest for tonight, you guys. You may have seen him on my Sunday morning conversations at the beginning of this quarantine. He is my trainer. He is known as one of the go-to guys in Nashville. Just because of his innovative and unique approach to training, he is truly one of the best, is one of my closest friends in life. He always just has so much inspiration, and today we get right to that. Um, I actually was over visiting Jared and his family, and so we got to do this interview in person. So, Jared Houston, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. I have been trying to educate myself a lot about the, the problems in our country right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure as a lot of you have seen, I've been posting it all over socials and you've clearly seen people who are speaking out about it and who aren't speaking out about it and it it just causes so many emotions to be stirred up and I feel like on both sides of the argument there's a lot of education that needs to happen oh yeah mm. and in my education I have just been floored by by some of the things I've read, you know, the, the level of systemic racism that happens in our country, still to this day, that a lot of people aren't even aware of. I guess I want you to maybe talk about times where you have felt racism. I mean, it could go back from my childhood to yesterday. We went to a get together with my wife's friends the other day. I don't know a lot of them. It was about 60 people, maybe. Um, I knew about five or six people and I was sitting at a table and there was a really racist comment that was made. It was to, to the fact that the matter was, is I know we don't have, we're not following the rules. And if the police come, then I'll just say I'm with Jared and it's a protest. <laughs> Um, because now, because you can ride and tear stuff up now and we'll be safe before Jared. Blew my mind. 
two days before that with my in-laws. We're sitting at a restaurant, three white guys are mouthing stuff at me. The whole time, my in-laws, they're oblivious because their backs to them, they can't see. And I'm with my kids and I thought I can make one or two decisions. I can either go to the table and address it or I could just tolerate it. I was upset. I mean, I, it took me a while to get over it. I shed some tears about it because the fact of the matter was not that they were attacking me, trying to get me to instigate, trying to instigate me to get me to do something so they could justify their actions. It was the fact that they would do that and I had my kids with me. Like, if you're willing to go that low because of what you believe or how you, you think I make you feel when I've done nothing, and children are around, then why should I not defend myself to the death? But I had to realize like I have to tolerate. It was difficult. Um, I see um, the shooting in Atlanta. I see the young brother being hung in the park. Um, I see all this going on. And the first thought that comes to my mind is people with power becoming the judge, the jury, and the commissioner and justifying their actions or people saying that people because this happened because of their actions. Yeah, I can see um, that there could be less profiling on all cops because all cops are considered bad. Even when I was growing up, even in a small country town, my dad told me the rules. When you get pulled over, pull your, put your hands up. This is way before any of this. Put your hands up, hold your license in your hand, and roll your window down first and speak loudly so when they come to the to the window that they are not afraid. Not all cops are bad. You could, we as people could apply more for those positions um, and not being ousted for doing that. Because I know in my neighborhood and where I'm from, even from a small country town, if you're a young black kid and you say you're gonna go um, and you wanna be a police officer, you're automatically made fun of. You call a snitch, call it Uncle Tom, you called all kinds of derogatory things too. So it was like, dang if you do, dang if you don't. When I've seen some of my friends get guns put on them for no reason and not being shot, I could see the cops saying that the cops need to have more constraint and empathy. That there could be a high, higher educational standards for becoming a cop. You know, there could be more diversity in hiring. I know they push for that. But as far as creating incentives, you know, um, there could be classes or forums taught to better understand other cultures, races, religions, and everything. But the biggest thing is my question is tolerance. From my childhood to now, I've always been taught to tolerate and turn the other cheek. And that's the part that drives me insane. From the restaurant, if I would have said something to those young, to those young three guys, and just went up to him and said, hey, man, is, is there a problem? Is there anything I can do? Um, they would have felt uncomfortable. And I would have been wrong. If I would have said something at Laura's friend's party, I would have been wrong. If one of the guys that is in the country singing, uh, he has that platform. A lot of people, he's been saying a lot of, a lot of hate. Hate combated with hate doesn't justify your actions. And I don't understand that, so I just tolerate. Hate doesn't solve hate. But what do you do? But what do you do so you don't have to live in tolerating circumstances all the time? I think that's what it is. I think from every, respect is the word tolerate. I almost feel bad for them because I learned from an early age, like I can lash out, I can fight. I could fight these problems and it would only minimize it because it was short term relief. But I'm gonna tell you, destroying other things because you're frustrated shows immaturity, shows that you know that you're not able to express yourself. And I understand that, but at the same time, <laughs> Destroying other things is only creating more of a divide within your own community. That hurts. Me burning down a police station, me burning down something, might show my emotions right now because I'm spewing it out because I'm getting it out. 
but I also hurt other people that had a job, other people that have kids. And that's what's really bothering me. And that's what I'm understanding what tolerating is. It's like, tolerating, you can talk to people, you can respect them and love them the way you talk to them. So tolerance, from your perspective, is understanding people's ignorance. Mm. Yeah. And by that, and although it's not right, and it is nowhere near what you should have to think about, but it, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So does it give you a little bit of peace from your perspective? Yeah, instead of going down, as soon as I see someone that even feels like, because if I feel it, I can, I'll tell it to my wife later, I could act the same way. The only thing I see running rampant right now is, is a divide, obviously, but it's it's the one thing that everyone has similar, whether it's left, right, middle, whether it's black, white, religion, whatever, selfishness. Mm -hmm. If you divide it like that, then everyone's on the same side. Mm -hmm. You can divide race, religion, politics, everything, a whole bunch of ways, but the way everybody's acting is selfish because nobody really cares about how another person feels. Simple as that. And very few people do. Very few people. Absolutely. But the word says a thousand of them were standing outside and only one person was upright. In other words, Christians, everybody, they know who God is, they'll say who God is, but they act in one way. They act in a totally different way. That's hard. So even people that are speaking up for the movement or for change have ulterior motives, have have underlying things to do this for a reason. Um, so how do we get to a better place? We have education at the tip of our fingers. You know what I'm saying? I can look up and see when the Civil Rights Movement was, the act was passed. And I know that if you're 65 years old, that you were 66, that you were one years old. So my parents were 65. So they lived through that slave, they lived through when their people that they knew were still slaves. You can see all that information, but at the end of the day, just because you have that information doesn't mean you have power. Just because, because maybe you don't, maybe you're not racist now, or you think all lives matter, or you think black lives matter, or you think blue lives matter. It, it's whether you stand up on that opinion or not, is humble yourself enough to hear somebody else's story. And but without having derived to already an ending to who they are. Because what I've always learned is from my past, it doesn't define who I am. It might change your course, but you can always be changed. You can always be forgiven. That's what I was taught. So the biggest thing that my problem is, is like I said, selfishness. I don't know how to accept change except my household, my three kids. Because if I would have acted, my children, two of my kids were there, my wife was there. If I would have acted out, it could have changed the trajectory of their life. Subconscious. So I'm honestly like, I don't know. Nobody cares unless it directly affects them. Everybody always says, well, I didn't think it happened in this neighborhood. It's always happened. It's always happened. You just, it just hasn't, just hasn't been on your front step. Can we be more restorative with each other? Yeah, but it takes time. Because just because you're ready don't mean I'm ready. That's true. And it takes courage. Yeah. And you have to be able to know if you bring up a conversation. Oh, yeah. You don't that know could, what you're going to get. That could be received so many You don't know what you're going to get. You might get tears. You might get yelling. You might get screaming. But it's the fact that it matters that if you genuinely, you really sit down and say, how can I help and sometimes be honest, people. How you can help? Stay out the way. Like some people don't too much. Like some people are doing too much. I agree, but I think that we all need to learn how to be better humans. Oh yes. And how to work on this first. Yes. And then in our houses and our families, and then we can start to go outside. But until we figure out this first, yep. and then what I'm learning is after you have those things, then it is 
scary, but you you need to take a stand for it. You need to yeah. call out your friends. Yeah. I've had to do it. Call out your family. Like, mm. I feel like we're in the midst of a revolution that so, I have not lived yeah, in see, my lifetime. But the way you call them out. So, you know, I always go back to the word. It says, if you see a brother or sister standing, gently pull them to the side. I think people's ego and pride will be handled a lot, dealt with a lot better. If you take a second, instead of you saying it now and trying to react for to sure. prove a point, for you to get points with a society, or with a certain norm that you're supposed to follow, it's like, hey, man, like when I get a chance, the dude that was at the party, I'm going to pull him to the side and talk to him. Totally. Because yeah. I can't talk to him now because I was frustrated. Some people are just going with it because that's the norm. Because everybody, if you don't, you get ousted. But the people that are really true, what are you going to do three months from now, six months from now? Because I'm 37. I've been living this for 37 years. I know what it's like. So are you going to be with the movement and as far as the movement of change? I don't care, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what kind of car you're driving. Because at the end of the day, I'm still going to treat you the best I can because of who you are. But if you show me who you are, then I have to accept who you are. Like, that's why some people, they're defined by what they do. A lot of these movements, they're defined, it defines them. And I'm going to get beat up for this. But at the end of the day, these movements don't define me. What I do in this house, what I do before I come out of this, that's what defines who I am. I'll say this. People say you chose a um, brother that, that got killed to be our Messiah. No, 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 no. It's that people tolerated it enough so long that they stood up and he just so happened to be there. When someone is put up on there, you have to also realize that they're gonna bring out all the darkness comes to the light. So, did he have a rap sheet? Yes, so do I. Did he, did he do things he should have done in his life? Yes. Did he still help in the community? Yes. From that small list, we're the same people. And I'll never go back and say, I never forget about what I've done, but I know that doesn't define me. So I do, man. I think it's just everybody is lumped in one big selfish pot. And within that pot, everybody thinks they're different because they're either left or right, conservative, or they're black, they're white, they're racist. No, no, no. Everyone is in one pot, and that's called selfishness. Once you start to humble yourself and you pull yourself out and you want that restorative talk and you want to get to know someone, then that's when you're actually separating. So what are you going to do? You know, you say, I'm going to, you know, people, I, I used to always say, people say, you know, I'm not racist. I live beside a black, I live beside a black couple. You know what I'm saying? Like my, that, that used to be my best. I've like, heard that said. I used to live beside, like, I used to live beside, I love the Boatlands. So if y'all are hearing this, I love you. Mm -hmm. They were like, you know, we're not racist. We went beside the Houston's. Hate is, is is learned. It's taught. You know what I'm saying? It's taught. If I ask my daughter what color people are right now, I'm automatically creating that divide. You know what I'm saying? When she gets older, I want to, her to embrace that she is black and she is African American, but I also want her to realize that she's white. I want her to embrace both sides. I want her to know who she is. She's beautiful, not because she's black or white. She's beautiful because she's my daughter. I posted something, gosh, last week or so, where it had this dad talking to his son. He was like, hey, buddy, what do you see here? And he was pointing to his computer, and it had four pictures of a black kid and a white kid. Black kid and white kid. Black. And like the first one, they were like playing in the grass, and then they were like, running down the street or whatever. They were just doing different things. And he was like, what do you see in these pictures? And he's like, they're having fun. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, do you notice anything else? And he's like, ah, the tall grass. Like he just kept explaining yeah. the pictures and he never said anything because yeah. kids don't see it. It's something that is learned. 100%. This movement is going to change the trajectory of non-believers, believers, People for the movement, people not for the movement, for years to come. And I think that's what history is. I'm going to speak on some again. There's a lot of racist statues. When I say racist, people say heritage. Do I believe they should be in the courthouse down here? No. 
Do I feel like they should be in a museum? Yes. Because if they're in a museum, it changes the whole perspective of to where you see where you came from, because I would. But do I think celebritizing or putting it out there like that, I do think it is a joke. Um, I do think it is a joke and a mockery to certain people. If we came from one. We um, should be as one. We should be as one. Well, I know I am going to be trying my best to learn every single day and do what I need to do to take care of here. And then, and then the next step is here. And then the next step is here. Um, thank you. God help us. Um, thank you for doing what you do. Cause it does, it brings a lot. It's a lot of triggers. It's so weird, it's so crazy. Cause you don't think so, cause you sweep it under the rug. And then when things start to happen, and then when you start to realize what you have to lose every day and who I say that I am, and I have to walk this way, and so be it. It's my hope that you can get to a place where you don't need to sweep it under the rug. Hmm. I know. I guess our, that our world can get to a place where you don't need to sweep that under the rug. And I'm able to do that. I'm able to pull it out and kind of reassess it, kind of talk it out because you're willing to. You're willing to. Man, this is, this is a lot heavier than what I thought. <laughs> I mean, that's the hard part about it. These conversations aren't the easiest to have. But um, <laughs> thank you guys for watching this. Um, for sticking with us. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. Guys, I think this is an important conversation that we need to continue to have. I am doing my best at educating myself consistently and I think that we can we can help each other out with that. And so I thank you for listening to what I have to say and watching these videos and and commenting on my posts, um, please DM me or, or comment on this video if you have ideas of guests we could bring on Living Well in the future. I would love to hear um, all of your suggestions. But now it's time for the Wellisms of the Week. I love the Wellisms of the Week, you guys. All right, first up. Band-Aid will finally make multiracial bandages with darker skin tones. I love this. The bandages will come in light olive and darker shades of brown and black tones to reflect the diversity of consumers who need bandages. The company said, we hear you, we see you, we're listening to you. We stand in solidarity with our black colleagues, collaborators, and community. Yes, Band-Aid. So cool. All right, second wellism of the week. The COVID-19 pandemic has closed schools and public libraries across the country, but a librarian in Virginia thought of the idea to have drones deliver books straight to kids' doors so they can keep reading. How cool is that? This middle school librarian has been using the Google spinoff company called Wing to deliver meals and household products for a while now, and she decided to do this for her students. That is so amazing. Yeah, using drones. Okay, this is a cool story. Drones are actually being used for many good things throughout this quarantine. Although this grandpa only lived a third of a mile away from his grandkids, he wasn't able to see them due to social distancing. So he used this drone to deliver them donuts while still keeping in line with COVID rules. Watch this video. grandpa right there. That is a very good grandpa. All right, for our last Willism of the week, this was truly incredible. A group of six teenage girls who met on Twitter were responsible for the massive protest in Nashville last week. Over 20,000 people took to the streets to support Black Lives Matter in a fully peaceful protest. 
all freshmen through juniors in high school right now, ages 14 to 16, put this together in only five days and made so much loud, incredible noise in a powerful demonstration. Jade, Naya, Z, Kennedy, Emma Rose, and Michaela, my hat is off to you. That is incredible. Really beautiful, beautiful. And those are your Wellisms of the week. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Living Well. We will be hosting them on YouTube every week live. I have some very exciting news coming next week. So stay tuned on socials for that. But um, if you would like links to donate where you can educate yourself, I'll post them below in this video. And like always, let me know who you want to have on Living Well. I love you guys so much. We'll see you next week.